Hello slash x slash. I have lurked here, and on 4chan in general for a while now, and I have read many scary and disturbing stories from you guys. Well, I think that it is high time that I share my own story with slash x slash. I don't really give a crap whether you believe me or not, I'm just recounting to you a nightmarish experience that me and my friends had. Here we go. Be me. American, early 20s. About 13 years ago. Just finished getting an engineering degree at college. Relaxing in a cafe with the bois. We are all roommates, so we know each other pretty well. Me and three other friends, Craig, Maximilian, yes, that is his name, and I'm really fucking jealous of him for that since I think it sounds really fucking cool, and I'll be referring to him as Max occasionally, and Franklin, or Frank, what most people call him, decide to go on a bro trip. We decide on camping. We are not exactly experienced at Inwoods camping, but we have gone regular camping before and enjoyed it. Decide that as we are not very experienced, we need a place that is not way out there in the event that we manage to screw up something and need to leave. Franklin lived in New Jersey at the time. He suggests camping in the Pine Barrens. It covers a surprisingly large area and is as remote as we are gonna get considering our budget and where we live, Frank explains. The rest of us agree that the place sounds good. We start to plan out the trip. Decide that we need to go during the summer or fall, as a cold camping trip would suck ass. Maximilian proposes that instead of camping at some basic bitch campsite with like 200 other people, why not just go hiking, find a suitable clearing off the trail, and camp there for 3 or 4 days. We all like this idea. Greg says that his cousin could drop us off and pick us up, as we would not really have a place to park a car for several days while we romp around in the woods. Fast forward a few days. We have the trip all planned out, for the most part. Going to be out there for 4 days and 3 nights, leaving on Friday and returning on Monday. Greg's cousin will drop us off at the edge of the woods. Rendezvous with his cousin at the intersection of Long Island Expressway and Wading River Road on the 4th day. We have the following. A one-shot 22 LR rifle for each of us. Additionally, Maximilian has a 45 ACP 1911 and Frank has a revolver, 38 or 22, I can't remember which. Camping essentials, I'd rather not waste time describing all of them. I think Greg brought a fishing rod. A few changes of clothes. We decided against bringing our girlfriends, as Greg had just broken up with his, and we didn't want him to feel alone, and the other ones were not too crazy about spending several nights in the woods. Fast forward to the Friday. I have all my shit packed and ready to go. At like 10 or 11 am, Greg's cousin pulls up to our house in a dark green Plymouth minivan. We toss our stuff in the back and head off. It was like a hour and a half drive from the house to where we would get dropped off. For the sake of brevity, I will refer to Greg's cousin as Carl. Carl seems like a pretty cool guy. He graduated uni a few years before we did. The drive there is fun. We mainly talk about what we are gonna do, where we are gonna hike, what we are gonna eat. Fast forward to us driving along the forest's edge. Check for officers. Area is secure.jpg. We pull off to the side of the road that we are on. Unpack and hop out. Wave and say goodbye to Greg's cousin. Head off into the woods. We plan on hiking for a few hours until we find a good clearing. Hike a mile or two into the woods. It has been pretty nice so far. Little amounts of trash. Seen a few chipmunks and squirrels. Hear the birds singing. We definitely heard a few woodpeckers. We reach a clearing. It is roughly 45 or 50 feet in diameter. Worst part of it was a poison ivy patch on the northeast edge of the clearing. We made sure to avoid this area. Here is a pick of the area, pick related. MS paint area. We set up our tents in the area. We then build a fire pit and gather firewood, because why do that at night? Do you want a sprained ankle from tripping on some branch? Color code for map. Light green is clearing. Dark green is woods. Dark dark green is poison ivy. Red is tents. Orange is fire pit. Brown is logs. After setting up home base, we decide to hike some more and plink some targets. Hike is going nicely. 
see some geese flying in the distance in their familiar V formation. Unfortunately, see a few plastic bottles in some bushes. Sort of depressing and annoying. We see some freaking jewel Costco grocery bag stuck in a tree. We aren't exactly Al Gore, but something about being so far into the woods and still seeing some lazy people's trash really annoyed us. Frank is somewhat good at climbing so he decides to climb up there and pull it down. Sets his pack on the ground and begins the climb. The plastic bag is about 15 above the ground. It takes Frank about 3 minutes to get it. Oh crap. He yells. What is it? You okay? Yeah, I'll tell you once I get down. Frank untangles the bag from the branches that it was caught on and jumps back down to us, I saw some fucked up animal up there, he says. What was it? A screwed up raccoon, bro. Shit. Like how screwed up? Its head was mashed in and its chest was torn open, with all the ribs looking broken. Also, it smelled like burnt rubber. That's freaking gross. You didn't touch it, did you? It might have had some weird disease. Oh shit, I hadn't even considered that. Well did you? No, but I'm gonna put some hydrogen peroxide on my hands just to be safe. What do you think did it? My guess is that some hawk was carrying it, dropped it, got it back, and was in the middle of eating it when we showed up. It got scared, and flew a safe distance away. Sounds about right. Anyway, what was your plan with the plastic bag now that you are stuck with it? I hadn't thought of what am I supposed to do with this. It's not like there is a dumpster nearby. Just put it in your back pocket and let's get back to hiking. We've digged around here for long enough, and I don't want to be hiking to camp in the dark. Sure thing. We continue on our hike. Some quick info. Since I live in the suburbs, I'm used to seeing a bunch of fat and slow squirrels and chipmunks that run only if you are right next to them. So it is always sort of a weird experience for me to go in the woods and see timid, skinny squirrels and how rarely you see them compared to the suburbs. So I was already feeling a bit weird due to how far I was out of my environment. I told myself that everything was fine and that any weird feeling or concerns of mine were just from living around many humans and technology. I know that was worded kind of badly, but you get what I mean. I'm including this because I figure that it would helpful to know more about my state of mind and attitude towards spoopophiles in the woods. Anyway, back to the story. We are marching along. See the sun just beginning to set. Tell the boys, and we start to head back. Head back the same way that we came, we don't want to get lost. By now, the sky has that orange-yellow hue to it that you sometimes get as the, the sun sets. It was quite pretty, to be honest. We are passing the tree that Frank pulled the plastic bag from. Greg trips on a large root that was protruding from the ground. He falls face first as his hands were in his pockets. Jigakek.jpg He stands himself back up. I'm about to ask if he is okay when I see a large, reddish-brown stain on his jacket that wasn't there before. The heck is that? I ask. Huh? Maximilian says. Greg looks down at his jacket, sees the stain, and starts freaking out. The heck is this? Crap. I just got this two weeks ago with Sarah. He yelled. Sarah was his girlfriend at the time, solid 8 out of 10. Maximilian grabs a longish stick and pokes at where Greg fell. Pushes a few leaves out of the way, exposing the corpse of a possum. That corpse was not a fresh one. The thing had its chest ripped open, with maggots all over it. Surprisingly, there was no noticeable smell. Seeing that the corpse was full of maggots, Greg was starting to spurg out. He ripped off the jacket whilst screaming, freaking god. Ah. I've got the freaking little grub freaks on me. Crap 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 crap. God freaking damn it, or something similar. Greg began to swing his jacket into some tree, probably in an attempt to get the maggots and blood off. Frank grabs a wad of dry leaves and handed it to Greg. Use this to try and wipe off as much scum as you can. The heck is a handful of freaking leaves gonna do? I need a freaking scrub brush and a hose, Greg barks at him. Hey asshole, shut the fuck up. Frank is just trying to freaking help you. And for right now, that's the best cleaning supplies that you can hope to get your hands on.
We're in the middle of the goddamn woods, remember? I yell. Greg is about to fire a retort when Maximilian chimes in, Anon has a point, Greg. You'll have to wait until we get back to our campsite before you can actually wash it. And it is just a dang jacket. Stop spazzing out over some blood. We are on this to relax and celebrate our graduation. Yelling at each other and screeching about some gunk isn't exactly my idea of relaxing. Greg is able to get most of it off, but there still was a fist-sized reddish-brown spot. We resume our hike back, with most of the sunlight gone. This inspires us to move at a much faster pace, since trying to find your way through unfamiliar woods at night is almost freaking hopeless, and we can't just set up camp, as all of our sleeping gear was back at the clearing thankfully. We reach the clearing after roughly 30 minutes and don't get lost in the woods at night. Maximilian gets the fire started as me and Frank get the food out. Greg is trying to remove the possum blood with some dish soap, paper towels, and some of the distilled water we brought with us. Max asks us what food we packed. Me and Frank take turns announcing each thing we packed as we pull them all out. Jerky ugh, refried beans spam the magical fruit wait, what? The magical fruit, Frank answers. You know, beans. Craig, who must have been listening to us, adds in, I have literally never heard a sane person refer to baked beans as the magical fruit. Why do you call it that? It doesn't even look like it could be a fruit. My dad and his side of the family have a goofy little song that they sing when they are eating beans, Frank responds. Who wants to hear it? I egg him on, saying sure, dude. Who wouldn't want to hear some hillbilly song about eating beans? I'm not a hillbilly, you dick. Do you want to hear it or not? Yeah. Okay then, Frank says. Here it is. Beans, beans, the magical fruit. The more you eat, the more you toot. The more you toot, the better you feel, so I have beans every meal. Whatcha think? Funny. Maximilian speaks first. I wouldn't say that was high class humor, but I did find it funny to imagine you and like five other grown ass men singing that at the dinner table. BTW, Frank is pretty buff, and so are all the other guys in his family. So the image of like six buff men singing, the more you toot, is absurd enough for me and my homies to get a keck out of the song. We all enjoy a good, hearty keck and Franklin seems quite pleased with himself. The meal we decide on just so happens to be baked beans. Max yells that it's dinner time. The rest of us head over, grab a plate, Max serves us our share, and we sit down on some large rocks. Frank immediately goes in a one. And a two. And a three. We all break into song, sort of in unison. Beans, beans, the magical fruit. The more you eat, the more you toot. The more you toot, the better you feel, so I have beans every meal. We all cheer with completion of our badly synchronized recital and begin to consume our dish. I yo this dude eaten beans pdf. In the middle of our ritual of the consumption of the baked beans, a loud shriek tears through the woods. I don't really know how to describe it, since I don't hear animal cries where I live, but rest assured, it was really freaking loud, and was more painful to hear than being in a room full of people scratching their nails across a chalkboard. What the hell was that? Was that some sort of animal's death screech? I ask my friends. I've heard the screams of dying animals before, and that sounded nothing like one. It was too loud for a dying animal to make, too. You'd have to be sitting right next to the animal for that kind of volume Greg tells me. Well, whatever it was, it made me drop my plate, Max groans. I glance over at the ground in his direction. Poor dude's plate landed upside down, and none of his beans survived. Greg offers some of his, and the problem is solved. They all resume their meals like nothing happened while I sit stunned. What, that's it. None of you are the slightest bit concerned or even curious. None of you have the slightest clue to what that was, so you guys have decided to just ignore it? I guess so. What we're planning to do? Go into the woods at night to try and figure out the source of a scary loud noise? Replies Frank. Well, no, but... Then do your best to ignore it. We can sleep on shifts if you want. You can sleep on shifts. I want to get a good night's sleep, adds in Greg. 
Okay. You sure you're fine with this, Frank? I say. Yes, I am. Stop squealing about it before I change my mind, he answers. I shut up and finish my meal. Frank rolled up a couple of logs around the campfire. We head over and begin to talk around the campfire. We are sharing stories about college. As Maximilian and Greg are telling us about a shitty professor they both had, I look over at Frank. He is staring wide-eyed past Max and Greg, deep into the woods. I follow his line of sight and it takes a minute or two before I notice them. The hair on the back of my neck goes straight up and I get goosebumps on my skin. I can see a pair of two yellow-orange eyes about 20 yards away. I'm not exactly able to tell how high of the ground they are. Max and Greg, noticing that no one is listening to them and are instead looking into the forest, ask us what the heck is so interesting. Right as they say this, something makes a loud snort slash grunt. This is followed by a long growl. Like a large dog's growl, but deeper, louder, and far more menacing. I get up, and now realize how big this thing must be. The eyes are at my eye level, and I'm six foot four. Max and Greg, who are closest to the edge of the clearing bolt off of their logs and get to our side of the campfire. Frank snaps out of his gaze and grabs his revolver. He stands and aims it at the eyes, yelling at it to piss off. The rest of us dart over to our tents and retrieve our guns and spare ammo. I load mine. We get in a line. We aim. Frank says, on the count of three, fire. One. Two. Three. Don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. Exe. Fire. We shoot in semi unison. We can't hear if we hit anything because multiple guns firing at once in close proximity on an otherwise quiet night is really freaking loud. Once I regain my full senses, I no longer see the eyes. Dang. I don't know whether to feel relieved or to feel more concerned. What the fuck was that thing says someone? Whatever that was, it's gone now. Okay. Anon, it looks like you've got your wish. We are definitely sleeping in shifts tonight, if we sleep at all. We all reload and set up a sort of perimeter. K slash would not be proud. We just cleared out all that would block our field of view. Basically, all vegetation or rocks over 6 inches were cleared. We used the logs to make a barrier-ish thing. This barricade served more purpose for our own feeling of safety, it did not really serve any realistic purpose for defense. The forest is now dead quiet. Shit is really creepy. Here is our plan. Dash 1 sleeps while 3 are awake. Dash 1 man has the 1911, one man has the revolver, and the other guy has the 422 rifles. The second a person sees something yellow or orange in the woods, they immediately fire a warning shot into the air to wake the other boys up and hopefully scare it off. Me. Frank, and Greg take the first shift. All is well. Second shift is me, Max, and Greg. At some point, Greg gets spooked by what he says is, some shuffling in the woods. He fires at it. Me and Max nearly jump out of our skin. Frank wakes up. We are pissed at Greg, but nothing else happened that night. Fast forward to the morning. We hastily pack up. We immediately go back the way we think we came, as we will some would have an idea of how far we must go. Greg says that he is going to check on the area that he shot at last night. We tell him to wait a few minutes so that the rest of us can go with him, for safety reasons. About five minutes later, we are fully packed, and head over to the area. We are looking around for signs that show that there was some sort of animal here last night. Max shouts out for us to have a look at what he found. There is a distinct trail of hoof prints. These were not deer tracks. These were bigger, and were cloven. My blood runs cold. Greg is pleased to see that he was correct to fire. Max reminds him that if this was a human, he would be feeling otherwise. Frank says that maybe this was from a cow or horse. I tell him that these woods are not a good environment for a fully grown cow, and that it would have been much louder last night if it was a horse that Greg shot at. Greg shuts up. We are all thoroughly spooked, and decide to GTFO. We begin our trip back to the highway. Our plan is to get to the highway before sundown and then try to hitch a ride. We make sure that our guns are loaded and head off. 
We are hiking through the undergrowth as fast as possible now. We aren't the fittest people, so we are not moving very fast. However, the hike back is very different from the hike to here. Landmarks are different, or look different, or are not there at all. Fallen logs that I remembered to be covered in mushrooms are instead covered in thick layers of moss. This may not sound scary or disturbing, but when you are trying the GTFO of the woods and you think that there may or may not be an animal stalking you, it is different. These differences in the landmarks and environment throw us off a bit. At roughly noon, we realize that we do not know where we are going. Greg starts to freak out. We all start to freak out. Like the retards that we were, we did not think to bring any sort of flares. It takes the four of us like 30 minutes to get our shit together. Thankfully, me and Frank had packed compasses. When we entered the woods, we went northeast. We decide that our best option is to go straight south. About a half an hour after devising the new plan, Frank spots a half-eaten deer. The deer has had its stomach torn open. Intestines aren't visible. Its thighs have been mostly consumed. Its eyes are also eaten. This creeps us out more, but we aren't too concerned by it since, Frank suggested that it was left behind by some coyotes. But I didn't believe that for a second. I don't think that the other guys noticed this, but like 20 yards past the deer carcass, I saw four other dead, half-eaten deer. At least one of them was a buck with a full rack of antlers. I choose not to tell them, as I believe that more fear will not help us escape the woods. I was probably right to do so. Unfortunately for us, that first deer was not the only carcass that the group of us came across. Every 10 to 15 minutes, we would come across a new animal corpse. More deer, birds, rabbits, and squirrels. All are partially eaten. All have the same parts of them eaten as the first deer. Each corpse we find only adds to our anxiety and fear. But we still tell ourselves that it is probably just a pack of coyotes. This possibility brings us a sense of security, however small sense of security. That was until we found a coyote. It's half eaten, just like the others. Judging from what was left of the creature, it was healthy and muscular. This shatters our theory that coyotes were responsible for all the dead animals. I don't know very much about coyotes, but I don't see why a pack would just turn on one, kill it, and eat it in the same fashion as every other animal. Max is the first to put two and two together. The dude goes pale. It takes a second or two for the rest of us to catch on. Oh screw me mov. This epiphany shatters our last nerves. We break into a full sprint in the direction that we have been hiking in. This part is sort of a blur of sticks hitting my face, thorny plants scratching my skin, and sheer panic. I have no idea how long we ran for, but when we stopped running and regrouped, my watch said 4.45 p.m. We have two hours before sunset. Thankfully, no one got separated or hurt themselves during our mad dash, so we are good to go. We recheck out orientation with the compasses, and continue our trek south. We are no longer finding dead animals, which puts our minds more at ease. We start to believe that the worst is over. How freaking wrong we were. The next half an hour is mundane, with the most action being Greg almost tripping and falling into a poison ivy patch. It was actually kind of relaxing to just hike through the woods, believing the illusion in that it's safe. But after that calm half hour, crap hit the fan, and fast. Max was the first to notice it. He whispers at the rest of us to stay quiet. We shut up and hear it. The distant beating of wings. If you have ever been close to a large bird when it is flying, then you have an idea of what it sounded like. Only problem was, there were no birds in sight. Hide, Max whispers. Each of us scramble for a bush or a log to hide under. We are dead quiet. It takes what felt like hours for the sound of the wings to dissipate, but it was probably only 20 minutes. The fuck was that? Greg asks. I have no idea, but whatever it was, my guess is that it was responsible for all of those dead animals, Frank responds, and let's not be its next meal. We resume our journey yet again, but this time, we are all on high alert. We freeze every a branch snaps, or a squirrel rustles through the trees, or a woodpecker drills a hole. We are moving a lot slower, and it is getting closer and closer to sundown. 
Nothing really happens for a while. At 6.30, we stop to catch our breath. Orange is starting to appear on the horizon. I check my compass, and we are still on track. We decide on what to do. No one wants to stay another night in the woods, but Max and Greg are against hiking through unknown terrain at night, while me and Frank are convinced that if we don't continue on, we are gonna be a midnight snack for the thing that killed all of those other animals. I end up convincing them to go by pointing out the imminent danger of staying and pointing out that the road that we came down here on shouldn't be more than 2 miles away, which should only take us another 40 to 50 minutes. Unfortunately, this took a grand total of 15 minutes for us to decide, and the sky is orange from the sunset. After 25 minutes, the only light is from the moon, which is very bright as there were few clouds, and an old oil lantern that Greg brought with, so we are now walking in a single file line with Greg leading the way, like a bunch of kindergartners. And it's here where crap hits the fan. Greg asks, hey guys, is it raining? There are literally no clouds in the sky, and we tell him so. Then why am I feeling water dripping onto me? He asks as he shines the light of the lantern into the trees. Why did God leave us? PDF? The light illuminates the face of the ugliest and most terrifying thing I have ever seen. It is a cross of a goat in a horse's shape, with bright yellow goat eyes, but without any fur. It opens its mouth and roars same roar that we heard last night, but a thousand times louder. Its gums are black, its tongue is pink and like that of a dog, and its teeth are almost as yellow as its eyes. This thing's canines were at the least an inch and a half long. Its chin has a few dark brown or black hairs. The rest of it is not illuminated enough to make out. It catches all of us by surprise. For one long ass second, we all look on in a mixture of shock, fear, and awe. Then our fight or flight instincts kick in and we bolt. It roars again and takes flight. In the distance, we see the street lights of a road, and run even faster. I'm crying like a bench, with a my tears from joy and fear. We make it to the road, and continue running down it. Max is ahead of everyone. I'm behind him. Frank is behind me. Greg is behind Frank. But then Greg trips, stumbles for a second, and face plants. I screech to a halt and turn around and get a good look at the thing for the first time. Unless I get Alzheimer's or dementia, I will never forget the sight of that abomination approaching my friend. It is a massive beast, and it has the same kind of muscle tone as a Russian power lifter. It has the body of a hairless horse, and is covered in scars of all different sizes and shapes, some look like the scars of a knife wound, but others look more like bullet holes. Its skin is a putrid pinkish red color. It has the hind legs of a horse, but instead of having four legs, it has a pair of massive, muscular human arms with human hands. The nails of the hands are at least an inch long, sharp looking, and black in color. It has a long rat-like tail, I'd estimate a length of roughly 7 to 8 feet, with a few sparse patches of dark brown or black hair. The abomination is at least 20 feet long and 6 feet at the shoulder. Its neck is like a foot long, but probably like 2 feet in diameter. I now notice the long, semi-curved horns protruding from its head, like those of a goat. You probably know what I'm talking about now, and if you don't, it's the Jersey Devil. It touches down on all fours like 30 or 40 feet in front of Greg. Greg fires his 22 at it and hits it square in the chest. It doesn't acknowledge being shot at all. It walks on all fours and reaches for Greg, who is in the middle of reloading his rifle. I don't want this freaking thing eating my friend. I call it some racial slurs, can't remember which. Slide the bolt into place. I take aim. Pull the trigger and fire. I hit it right next to its right eye. This it notices. It rears up on its hind legs, clutching its eye, roaring louder than a police siren. Roar is different this time, it is still loud and deep, but now it also has the sound of a dying cat. Frank and Max stop running and see the predicament that me and Greg are in. They draw their rifles and fire at it, drop the rifles, draw their handguns, and sprint over to where I am. This only seems to anger the beast more, as it grabs Greg. Greg screams in pain and several audible snaps are heard. Max and Frank shoot at its torso. It throws Greg into a light post and begins to advance on us, and we back up. I see something behind it a light. I squint my eyes. 
It's a cop car. I'm hoping that he can call back up or help us shoot it. As the monster quickens its pace, the cop arrives. To everyone's surprise, the car slams into the monster. The monster is sent sprawling. Two cops exit the vehicle and pull out very shiny lever action rifles, I think that they were for 45 to 70 government, and start to shoot it. It screams like it did when I hit it in the head and contorts its body in pain each time one of the cops fires another round into it. We get the idea and join in the shooting. At some point, the abomination must have decided that we were not worth the pain, got up on all fours, and ran into the woods. After we were sure that it had left, the three of us run over to check on Greg, we make sure that he is still alive, he is, and then me, Max, and Frank talk to the cops. What in the heck was that? Max asks. They act as if he said nothing. You boys sure are lucky that the two of us were driving down the road, one of the cops, a blonde, chubby guy, says, those rabid buck are violent as hell and a damn sure menace with their antlers. You were not packing anywhere near enough firepower. Me and Frank are about to call his lie, but the other cop, an older looking man, gives us a death stare that shuts us up. The only thing that you ever saw attack your friend was a large buck with a bad case of rabies, he flatly says, nothing else. The cops get an ambulance to for Greg and took us to the hospital. Greg had fractured his tailbone, broken several ribs, and broke his right shoulder blade. No one at the hospital asks us what happened after we tell them that it was a rabid buck. Frank calls up Greg's cousin and explains the scenario, minus the monster. The rest of us were fine, minus bruises and scratches. And there you have it. Greg recovered, though he will never be as fit or capable as he used to be. The four of us still keep in touch, as our only validation that this was real, that this really did happen, is the fact that we all know what we saw, and that we all saw the same thing. I'm the only one on us who still enjoys hiking in the woods, but that is probably because I live in Colorado, far away from New Jersey or the Pine Barrens. But every once in a while, if I have an exceptionally bad day at work or go to sleep very stressed, it visits me in my dreams, chasing me and my friends through the woods and down that road. I'll be checking into here throughout today and tomorrow, if anyone wants to talk. Can you make a quick sketch of how the thing looked? If you're bad at drawing I'm sure other Anons will do it if you describe it in detail. Here you go.